Hi folks, Matt Easton here for Scholar Gladiatoria Channel's reviews. Um, so I have been sent a sword by Jiri Krondak at uh, Fabri Armorum. Um, and I have encountered uh, their weapons before in a kind of reenactment context. And to be honest, their reenactment swords uh, never sort of impressed me uh, much because they tend to be quite heavy and clunky and obviously made for the type of use uh, that you see in reenactment fighting. Uh, but recently they have uh, clearly uh, started branching into um, HEMA swords, that is, uh, more flexible and lighter. Uh, practice weapons for the use in historical fencing. And what we have here is a one-handed arming sword, as it's commonly called, or as it was called in the medieval period, a sword. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a one-handed sword, relatively short, it's a 27 inch blade. Um, so it's the kind of sword that you might uh, commonly use with a shield or a buckler. Um, and it's a kind of, uh, probably I would say, you know, kind of 14th century design. Uh, it's got a, a tapering blade, it's got a filler in the base of the blade. Um, but most importantly for uh, HEMA and historical fencing purposes, it is made to be uh, a safe training weapon. Um, the things that define it as that are that it is... Um, it's the same weight as a sharp sword, so it's not overbuilt, um, it's not over engineered like most reenactment weapons are. A lot of reenactment one handed swords weigh three and a half pounds, sometimes even heavier, which is a bit on the heavy side for, a, for an actual real medieval one handed sword. An average medieval arming sword of this kind of size and shape usually weighs about two pounds, so they're, they're pretty light. Um, and this is that kind of weight, it's the right kind of weight and it's the right kind of balance. It actually balances, as you'll see, it balances quite close to the cross, probably about one inch, maybe one and a half inches from the cross. Now that's closer in general than you want a, a real cutting sword to balance to the hand. Swords that balance that close to the hand tend to make very poor cutting swords. Um, however, in a sparring sword it's not necessarily a bad thing at all because by bringing the point of balance back towards the hilt, it has less impact in the in the tip uh, when you're hitting with it. Which obviously, if you're sparring with people and hitting uh, your opponent, who obviously is wearing protective gear, um, fencing mask, padded jacket, and so on, um, you still don't want to be hitting with too much force. That's one of the main reasons, incidentally, why um, why a lot of people tend not to spar with things like falchions because it's very difficult to make something like a falchion or indeed an axe uh, in, a, in a sparring safe format. Whereas a sword, it's fairly easy to make in a sparring safe format. You just make it blunt and generally speaking you bring the point of balance a bit closer to the hand and it makes it a bit more friendly, shall we say, uh, to, to hit each other with. Obviously you have to wear all the protective gear. Um, so it is blunt, it is a completely flat blade, so it's like a feather or feather shirt as they're commonly called these days. Um, it doesn't have any uh, sort of profiling, any, um, any grind to the edge or anything like that at all. It has no edge. It's, it's utterly blunt and it's made of one flat tempered piece of steel. The uh, profile uh, distribution of mass in it is gained by the tapering of the blade, the fact that it starts off normal sword width and tapers down towards a blunt point. Okay, um, and that gives it the right kind of mass distribution. As I've mentioned in previous videos, um, swords often have distal taper, that being that they're thick at the base of the blade and gradually get thinner. However, swords that are tapered and tapered this way um, are usually uh, specialised for the thrust and many of those swords actually don't have very much distal taper at all and some have no distal taper. The result being that you end up with a stiffer blade. In this, you don't end up with a stiffer blade because it starts off thin and it ends up thin. Uh, the thickness at the base of the blade is only about um, about two and a half to three millimetres thick, uh, so it's fairly thin at the base of the blade, and um, that is what I would say is I've got a minor criticism in that point. It doesn't necessarily matter because it, if you look, I'm actually flexing. Ah, there we go. I can just about flex it near the base of the blade which ideally you don't really want. When you're encountering another person's blade, um, you really want all of the flex to be as limited in the top part of the blade as possible. And if I just apply the point to my palm and push, you'll see that that is more or less the case. Okay? It does pretty much entirely flex in the second half of the blade, um, which is good. However, 
I would say that if you look at the point there down here, it's a fairly straight line from there to there when it flexes. So all of the flex is actually happening there. And that would be a point of concern for me, okay? Because if, if I thrust at someone and they come towards me at the same time, and I hit very, very hard, all of that thrust is happening, or all of that flex rather, is happening in a very localized region of the blade, just there. I would prefer to see a more even flex from the middle of the blade to the end. So it describes part of a circle. As it happens at the moment, only this portion is describing part of a circle, the edge of a circle, circumference, um, and the rest, here and here, is very, very straight. So I would say they haven't quite got the profile of the flex right yet for a sword that I would be 100% comfortable with. Having said that, it seems to be made of really good steel and generally robustly made, and I wouldn't have any worries sparring with it. It's just that if I were designing this, um, then that's one thing that I would pick up on to try and improve and make it a more reliable sparring weapon. I do believe that if this breaks, the place it breaks will be there. Now, I haven't yet used this for anything. I've, I've tapped it against other swords. I haven't yet used it for any drilling or any sparring, primarily because I didn't want to run the risk of potentially ruining it, and I am willing to ruin it in use to test it. Um, I didn't want to run the risk of ruining it before I'd had a chance to review it in one piece in front of the camera in its as new state, okay? I will do a future video where I bash and beat this and use it in sparring. I'm not gonna over abuse it necessarily. I might do it at the end, but I won't do it at the beginning. And I'm gonna use it the way that we would use it in sparring and use it in drilling to see how it stands up, okay? And I will be looking primarily at durability of the parts, how it all holds together, also edge hardness and of course looking for any fractures or breaks or anything like that. Um, the hilt is pretty standard, pretty much like a, a reenactment of one-handed sword um, from Fabri or Armorum. Um, it's a basic um, wheel pommel. It's a leather covered grip with a wire binding going around it. I think the wire is kind of unnecessary and it's also kind of wrong for that period. It's, that's kind of like what they did on Victorian swords, you don't really get that done really in that way on medieval swords hardly ever. Um, so they could have dispensed with the wire, but uh, the cross guard's perfectly fine. It doesn't have any rough edges. Um, it doesn't conflict with the hand. It doesn't, uh, on, some, on some manufacturers, you'll notice that the grip and the guard don't meet very well. Sometimes the grip is fatter than the guard and sometimes the guard's a lot fatter than the grip. That's not a very good thing because it tends to create a lot of friction with the hands and just generally be uncomfortable and not look very good. So it's really good that they have actually profiled the grip so it's the same, pretty much the same width as the pommel and the guard at uh, top and bottom. Uh, so the hilt, happy with. It's got a nice forged look. Um, I would imagine it's forged uh, rather than cast, or it might be cast and then roughly finished. Difficult to tell. Um, it's apparently peened at the end, although that isn't the end of the blade, so I'm actually not 100% sure how it's secured, but interestingly, I don't know if you'll be able to see in this light, but at the base of the pommel here, where the tang goes into the pommel, there's actually a lot of brass being filled in. So it seems to me possible that the way that this is attached, the hilt is attached to the tang of the blade, um, is that actually they've milled out a large hole in the pommel, they've inserted the end of the tang into the pommel, and then they filled it, the, the, the gap around the end of the tang, with molten brass by the look of it, uh, which presumably has brazed it all solid and turned it into a solid lump. I don't have a particular problem with that, but I would be curious to know how they're made, I haven't actually asked them, um, because that end that's normally the peened end of the tang doesn't look like the peened end of a tang at all. Okay, so um, my two points of criticism so far are really around the, the uh, thickness of the blade and the way, it's, um, the way it's tapered distally, the fact actually that there is no distal taper. I would prefer a blade that was thicker at the base. One of my concerns and suspicions is that this might snap at the base of the blade because it's only about two and a half, three millimeters thick at the base there with a filler as well, and the filler obviously removes the material, the filler being the groove. Um, so I'm a little bit concerned about how thin it is at the base of the blade. I'm also a little bit concerned about the fact that it flexes in a very localised region of the blade. Okay? Um, and um, also what I would say is I've noticed when flexing it that it does take 
a little bit of a set, only very slightly, and you can bend it back the other way. And that leads me to believe that the blade is probably relatively soft. Now that's not necessarily a big problem for a uh, sparring sword or practice sword, because soft blades uh, tend to bend rather than break. Um, whereas hard blades are more brittle and they tend to break quite suddenly into a sharp edge. Um, and so actual fact, a sword that's a little bit soft can be safer for, for sparring, even though it might not it might not be as durable in the long run because it will get chewed up on the edge and so on. Um, the last thing I'll mention is the tip um, and I, again I don't know how well you'll be able to see this on camera but the tip um, is nicely flared and blunt. I'm a big big fan of this type of um, blunt tip. It means that you don't necessarily need to add anything onto the end of the blade to make it blunter and safer for sparring. Um, as you will know, I've designed two models of um, Sabre with Peter Regnier and also with the Hema Sharp, um, and both of those have rolled, forge rolled tip tips. I'm a, I prefer personally rolled tips to these solid tips. The reason being that when you have a solid mass at the end of the blade, it makes the blade floppier when you're moving it around than it needs to be. It also means that when you're swinging it and hitting, you've essentially added a little solid lump of mass at the end which can make the tip hit harder than it needs to. A rolled tip is essentially hollow, because it's folded around, and because it's hollow you don't have the extra mass, um, and uh, you know, I think, I think that it's a simpler solution actually. The way they've built up this flared tip is interesting as well, because what they've obviously done is they've started out with a flat slab blade, uh, so they haven't got any extra thickness to you know, grind material away uh, to create that, or, um, or forge material away to create that flare tip. So what they've done is they've actually brazed on some extra metal and I don't know if you'll be able to, can you, I think you can probably just see the colour difference. There's some brass there and some brass there and you can see the same thing on the other side just about. So what they've done is they've brazed on some extra steel top and bottom and then ground it into that flared shape. Um, I haven't got any problem with that so long as it stays together. Uh, brazing was a very common method of joining two bits of steel before before modern electric arc welding. Um, and brazing is very strong. Many bayonets, uh, for example, military bayonets, use brazing to uh, keep bits of them uh, stuck together. Uh, so there we go. Fabri Armorum, uh, Fabri Armorum uh, Jerry Krondak Jr. being uh, the guy that I've dealt with. Um, this retails, I believe, for about 200 or 205 euros. Um, which is about 180 pounds, I think. Um, so it's not super cheap. It's about the same price as Peter Reginier. Um, uh, so we will see how this stands up. Um, I will put it through its um, through its uh, sort of, uh, tests in, in in my class, and I will um, video that, and uh, I will put that up as a part two to this review. But this is part one, the solid object. Do I like it? It's okay, it's quite nice, there are things I would improve on it, um, but uh, it looks like it might be a good basic one-handed sword practice weapon for HEMA. So I'll see how it performs. Cheers!